stepped up with the Finance Minister, Matthias Cormann. Uh, for the Minister for Finance and myself today are releasing the uh, final budget outcome for the last budget year of the Labor government. The final budget outcome for the last year of a Labor government is a deficit of $48.5 billion in dollar terms, the second biggest in Australian history. Uh, last year, in his last budget, uh, Wayne Swan promised a budget deficit of $18 billion. It ended up being $48.5 billion, a deterioration in excess of $30 billion. Of the $30 billion deterioration, 60 per cent was from the write-down of receipts, and in particular tax receipts. Uh, this comes down to the fact uh, that Labor continually overestimated the amount of tax that they would collect. They continually got it wrong. Uh, this is not a confected figure. Uh, it is the real numbers, what actually came into the budget. Uh, and uh, in relation to that, uh, there were a number of miscalculations by the previous government, uh, including in particular the failed mining tax, which was expected to raise around $700 million in 2013-14. It raised $100 million. Uh, don't forget it was originally meant to raise $9 billion in its original form in that year. Uh, there were other policy decisions which accounted for $11 billion of the uh, $30 billion, including the Reserve Bank capital buffer of $8.8 .8 billion. Of course, that is money that would come out of the budget at some point because the Reserve Bank Reserve Fund needed to be replenished either at that point of time or in the future uh, through the non-payment of dividends. Uh, there were also a couple of other issues. Uh, in particular, the Labor Party failed to pay for the redundancies they announced. They funded 800 redundancies, but uh, uh, they actually uh, accounted for 14,500 uh, and, uh, and uh, a lack of funding for offshore processing of illegal maritime arrivals. Uh, the fundamental point being uh, this draws a line under the sand of the uh, last year of Labor delivering a budget. They got a $30 billion, uh, made a $30 billion error between what they promised and what was actually the outcome. I'll ask the Minister of Finance to say a few words and then go to questions. Uh, thank you, Treasurer. So, uh, as the Treasurer has said, uh, the final uh, budget outcome for Labor's uh, last budget shows the extent uh, to which uh, the previous government had lost uh, control of the budget. Uh, when we uh, came into government in September last year, uh, we inherited a deteriorating uh, budget position, a weakening uh, economy and uh, rising unemployment. Uh, what the final budget outcome for Labor's last budget also shows uh, is that on coming to government, uh, we were able to stabilise the budget position uh, as a foundation uh, from which to repair the budget and put, put us back on a believable path uh, to surplus. Uh, so our objective in the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook uh, back in December uh, last year was to present the true state of the budget we inherited using more realistic uh, assumptions than those used by the previous government and also uh, dealing with some of the uh, unresolved legacy issues uh, that Labor uh, left behind and that the uh, Treasurer uh, just uh, went through in some detail. Uh, so what you can see today uh, is that the final uh, budget outcome for 2013-14 uh, is broadly consistent uh, with our estimates uh, in uh, the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook and at budget time earlier this year, uh, the constant deterioration of the budget bottom line under Labor uh, has stopped. Uh, the position has been stabilised, uh, which was a necessary precursor to our work to get uh, the unsustainable spending and debt uh, growth trajectory uh, we inherited from Labor uh, back under control. Um, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, the revenue side of the, uh, the uh, budget and the fact that uh, the Labor figures ended up uh, being incorrect and uh, you just mentioned that, you think that uh, the deterioration has stopped. Um, what gives you the confidence that your new figures uh, are looking, more, uh, looking stronger and uh, more reliable and uh, what particular measures have you taken that have locked that in? Well, I think there is an argument. I, I think uh, if you get some of the fundamental forecasts right and uh, instead of taking uh, a, 
overly optimistic approach to forecasts, you take a more realistic approach to forecasts, uh, then that ends up uh, feeding into your underlying forecasts uh, in terms of revenue. Uh, and uh, we've been proven right so far in that regard. Now, uh, there will always be one-off events or, or certain circumstances will create dramatic change. But uh, as you can see, I mean, there is a dramatic change. Two years ago, Wayne Swan promised that this year would be a surplus. It's a $48.5 billion deficit. So that is a dramatic change in two years, a massive dramatic change in two years without any single shocking event. And even before the last election, uh, they said it was going to be a $30.1 billion deficit. It turned out to be $48.5 billion and there had to be further write-downs in revenue. Now, there was nothing that we did that made a dramatic change to the revenue that came in the door during this year. It is simply the case that they got their numbers wrong. And so, Laura, the, 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 the proof is in the pudding. I mean, what we're presenting today is the actual outcome for 2013-14. We've gone past forward estimates and projections now. Uh, so, Labor, uh, as the Treasurer is saying, in May 2012 was still predicting a $2.2 billion surplus. By May 2013, that became an $18 billion deficit. And we know that in the 11 weeks after that, that deficit continued to deteriorate by more than a billion dollars a week. Uh, and, and so we inherited a deteriorating position. So what we set out to do was to ensure that in our first budget update in December last year, the assumptions that we used for our estimates were more realistic, that we took into account all of the legacy issues that Labor had left behind, not providing funding for their promises on offshore processing, not providing funding for public sector redundancies, uh, depleting the capital reserves of the Reserve Bank to an irresponsible level. So we presented our best estimate, and all of us in government, whether it is Labor or the Coalition, ultimately will be tested by how the actuals compare uh, with our forward estimates. And so that is the point we're making today. This is now the line under the sand uh, in terms of uh, the uh, record of the previous government. This shows what a mess Labor truly made. It also shows that we have stabilised the situation, that we now have a foundation from which uh, to repair the budget uh, and uh, get back uh, on a believable path to surplus. Are you preparing for write-downs in company tax revenues for this financial year? Uh, look, we will carefully and methodically go through the forecasts. Uh, my IFA will be published in December and uh, that will give the latest estimates. And what's the impact at the moment of the big fall in, in commodity prices? The forecast for the budget right. was six and a three. The forecast for the budget is six and three quarter fall in terms of trade. It's gone beyond that already. What's the, what's the feeling in terms of how right. that will feed through to your revenues? What, what we're putting to you today is the uh, final budget outcome for 2013-14. Uh, what we will put to you later in the year, as the Treasurer has just indicated, uh, is the update uh, of the 2014-15 uh, budget and the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook. Uh, that is uh, how these sorts of updates are provided. But if you're the finance minister, you've got a good feel for how things are flowing. And uh, it, would be very, it, it would be very irresponsible to provide a running commentary when, as you know, uh, in any budget at any one point in time, uh, there are a lot of moving parts, which is why there is an orderly and methodical process to provide updates on the budget. Are you suggesting you um, are you suggesting that Labor um, in office uh, manipulated the revenue forecast, so um, you know, manipulated Treasury? Uh, well, ultimately, the forecasts published in a budget belong to the Treasurer and the Minister of Finance. That's it. That's the bottom line. But uh, so you know, they look. Uh, uh, we are always, whenever we sit down with our officers, we pepper them with questions, we test their assumptions, we go through all the appropriate processes to ensure that we are satisfied, that forecasts are as robust as possible. Now, um, maybe the previous government didn't do that. I, I don't know, but they seem to get every number wrong. The, the government of the day is responsible for the budget forecasts. And, and when Wayne Swan and Penny Wong kept getting the numbers wrong. They kept overestimating revenue and underestimating their spending. Um, and like they can run as far as they like, they won't be able to hide from their responsibility. And we are taking responsibility the same way and we will stand 
by how uh, we perform against our forecast. You don't think Treasury had any responsibility? Oh, cool. Keep going. That's three in a row, David. You don't recall what we'll just go. Is this definitely the line in the sand? Because I'm sure you said some words similar to this at my EFO, and we've got six months on the budget under your uh, uh, governing. governing. Um, is this a definitely this, this the line? This is the final budget outcome for 13, 14. So these are actual numbers. These aren't forecasts. Yeah, these are numbers. Well, nine months of this budget. <laughs> well, we wish we could turn everything around uh, in a matter of milliseconds, but. Uh, well, so it's 47 billion and now it's 48 and a half. I yeah, mean, hang on. So, so let's, let's be very clear on this, right? Like, so under Labor, the budget position deteriorated by more than a billion dollars a week from the budget in May 2013 to the economic update in August. Uh, what we said when we came into government is that the deterioration was continuing. Uh, we did draw a line in the sand. Uh, in uh, my EFO, and we predicted 47 billion at that time. In the budget in my this year, that was updated to 49.5. Uh, we came in uh, halfway in between halfway. at 48.5. <laughs> now I got to say, I mean, if the previous government at any one point in time, uh, over a nine-month period, had been able to have uh, the actuals come in that close to forecast, I mean, they would have been celebrating in the eyes, I'm sure. Uh, Wayne Swan and Penny Wong never had uh, that uh, particular. Uh, capacity. You're on this here. is it. Okay. This is the final line of the. Well, well this is Labor's final budget. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, Treasurer, you say these. Um, uh, uh, the government must take responsibility. Uh, the government today needs to take responsibility for these numbers. Of course, at that time, Labor was saying to us, "Well, these are Treasury forecasts. They're our best forecasters giving them to us." Aren't you, in essence, saying that the Labor government exercised? Uh, uh, or, or flex these numbers to suit its <coughs> political purpose at the time. Well, they, we know they tried to do that in relation to a surplus. They kept claiming they were going to deliver a surplus. They never delivered a surplus. Then they were so bold as to claim they actually had delivered a surplus, publishing material in their own electorate saying they had delivered surpluses. Come on. I mean, these guys promised surpluses. They never delivered them. This is their last budget outcome the second biggest deficit in Australian history in so dollar we terms. We were never getting the numbers from. We were never getting the numbers from Treasury well, forecasters at all. We were well, getting Labor's figures. You know what? That, that is their issue. And let's just be very clear. Labor is all over the place with this because at the time they were hiding behind Treasury when as the government of the day, they were responsible. And the other week we had Chris Bowen coming out. No, no, no. We don't want Treasury to provide. Uh, the information on budget forecasts anymore. We want the Parliamentary Budget Office to do it. I mean, L Labor are making it up as, as they go. The truth is the government of the day is responsible. We are taking responsibility. We have drawn a line in the sand under Labor and we are repairing the budget. So overall, okay. just, just a couple of other questions. So, so, so uh, overall, um, I, I understand what you're saying about my EFO, but overall you're still confident that you'll be able to reach your surplus targets over the next couple of years despite falling iron ore prices and despite the costs of uh, incursions Laura, in the Middle East. Laura, there are swings and roundabouts. There are, uh, you know, literally hundreds of decisions that are going to be made between uh, this point in time and two or three years down the track. Uh, that, the bottom line your, your is... Your policy goal is still to reach Absolutely. Out. Our policy goal remains we have to get back to surplus and start to pay down the debt. Which David, month, last just one. Just uh, which month can we expect my uh, I said December, yeah. And that's because, I, as I said at the press club last year, I want us to have the most up-to-date data. This is another good example. I mean, it's much better to have the September quarterly accounts feeding into my EFO so that you've got more accurate data in my EFO than to do what the previous government did and mix it around in time and actually end up on the, the economic data from the previous financial year, which has perhaps little bearing on what your updated forecast should look like. Just, yeah. just a, a quick one. Uh, following the G20 uh, meetings at the weekend and with the IMF um, coming up, are you concerned about um, the health of the, the global economy, global growth? Are you seeing um, um, you know, greater headwinds coming at us from, um, from uh, the, the sort of global trends as they were well, outlined at the remains, weekend? There are significant global challenges, uh, but uh, they can be beaten. They can be beaten. Uh, Germany uh, has, you know, is obviously facing some new headwinds, uh, but the German government, which has been uh, fiscally prudent over a uh, extended period of time, does have the capacity uh, to address that in the short term. Uh, 
uh, it is also the case uh, that <clears throat> even though China is facing uh, some challenges, particularly in the property market, I think, uh, I think China can overcome some of those challenges and uh, it has the strength of leadership and the policy initiatives that give me confidence that uh, uh, China can uh, you know, meet its growth target or near its growth target. Um, and uh, uh, later this year I'll be visiting Japan on the way to China for APEC. Uh, I'm uh, looking to have further engagement with uh, Finance Minister Aso about the Japanese economy uh, in two weeks back in Washington uh, for the uh, IMF uh, and World Bank uh, autumn sittings uh, and also uh, for the G20 again in Washington in two weeks, uh, we'll get a further update as well. Senator Cormier, is it embarrassing that the banks have asked for more regulation given what you've done with COFA? Uh, not at all. Uh, what we're doing with FOFA, of course, is get rid of unnecessary and costly red tape, uh, which just pushes up uh, the cost of advice for uh, investors saving for their retirement, managing financial risks uh, through life. Uh, and we have kept all of the consumer protections that actually matter uh, to consumers now, such as the requirement for advisors to act in the best interest of their clients. Uh, and also the ban on conflicted remuneration for financial advisors. Now, uh, when it comes to uh, professional, ethical and educational standards, the government has said all the way through uh, that we, uh, of course, uh, support further efforts to keep lifting professional, ethical uh, and educational standards. We are working uh, with uh, the industry to do that in the best possible way, because the objective ought to be uh, to uh, make progress in this space uh, in the way that is as efficient, in a way that is as efficient as possible, so that we don't keep pushing up uh, the cost of advice. Now, uh, the Financial Planning Association, the Association of Financial Advisors, the SMSF's Professional Association, all have done some excellent work in recent years lifting professional standards, lifting ethical and educational standards. Uh, so we support that work. We are also progressing uh, right now uh, an enhanced public register of financial advisors, which will provide transparently available for consumers uh, information about advisor credentials, advisor status in the industry and so on. That is a sensible way forward. Uh, and we are supporting uh, the work of the Parliamentary Joint Committee, which is looking at uh, further measures to make improvements in this space. What I would say, well, what, what I would say in relation to the proposal that was put forward uh, by the Financial Services Council is that I don't expect anyone uh, to put up uh, the white flag when it comes to providing uh, leadership in the industry themselves about lifting professional, uh, ethical and educational standards. Uh, I, expect, I, I expect the Financial Services Council to join uh, others, like the Financial Planning Association, the IFI and SPI and others, uh, in providing leadership to the financial services industry on uh, lifting professional, uh, ethical and uh, educational standards. I don't believe that another layer of bureaucracy uh, on top of uh, the uh, regulatory arrangements that are already in place, uh, in, through uh, ASIG in particular, uh, is appropriate. Uh, now, I've uh, indicated that to the Financial Services uh, Council uh, directly. What I'm interested in uh, is working uh, with all stakeholders uh, to lift uh, professional, uh, ethical and educational standards in the uh, most efficient way uh, moving forward, um, recognising the work that's already been done, uh, but uh, I don't want anyone to say that we can't uh, do better, uh, even uh, within uh, the regulatory arrangements that are currently in place. To say that uh, somehow uh, the FSC doesn't have the capacity to provide leadership in this space themselves as well, I think is a cop out. So there were reports over the weekend that domestically you view changes to the industrial relations system as a way to boost growth. How much change do we need in industrial relations to get the kind of growth you're looking at? Uh, well, I wasn't the source of that report. Yeah. Um, just on FOFA, will you bring on the legislation on FOFA this afternoon in the Senate? Well, uh, no. The short answer to that is no, because our priority on Thursdays in the Senate, for those of you who are across the intricacy of the Senate, is actually a non-government uh, day uh, in the main. Uh, our priority today in the Senate, uh, as I understand it from our, our leadership team, uh, is to deal with the national security uh, legislation. The uh, improvements to the future financial advice laws is uh, on the list, but I would, I would expect that it will come up sometime next week. Thank you, everyone.
OK, so that was live from Canberra. The Treasurer, Joe Hockey, and the Finance Minister, Matthias Cormann, releasing the final budget outcome for the 2013-14 financial year, a deficit of $48.5 billion. The United Nations Security Council has unanimously approved a resolution aimed at halting the flow of foreign jihadists to Iraq and Syria. The council meeting was chaired by the US President, Barack Obama, who said words needed to be matched by deeds for years to come. The Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, also addressed the meeting and warned that terrorists could strike at home or in the Middle East. North America correspondent Ben Knight